Hi everyone, I'm Marike. I performed this research as a part of my master thesis project in cooperation with Matthijs de Weert and Veit from Ortec. So let's look a bit into the problem. So imagine you're a truck driver and you need to drive from Bologna in Italy towards Bratislava in Slovakia. If you just use some Google Maps planner, then you will end up getting this route, which is a 10 and a half hour drive. However, since you are a truck driver, you need to take a rest, a night rest. After nine hours of driving, you should take a rest of 11 hours. So that means that if you depart Monday at 6 o'clock in the morning, you will arrive Tuesday somewhere in the night. But Austria is quite a special country because it blocks trucks during the night. They are prohibited to drive there between 10 in the evening and 5 o'clock in the morning. So this gives quite an impact on the route because after taking the night rest you have to wait for three hours doing nothing before being able to drive again and arrive at 6.30 at the end. A better route would be this one. So if you just leave Austria and go to Hungary and take your night rest over there you're able to drive immediately further toward Bratislava and there you arrive at 4 o'clock in the morning, although it's, so that's two and a half hours earlier than the blue route, although it's a half an hour longer driving time. So planning these kind of routes is the research topic, and we focus especially on long distance trips through Europe, considering the truck driving bans that are active in Europe and the driver's legislation. So, considering these truck driving bans, these are introduced by governments in the European Union, mostly because of pollution and noise. And you can see on the map over here, all, wait, all yellow countries have a block on Sunday, so you're not allowed to drive there with your high heavy vehicle truck on Sundays. And the blue countries, so Austria and Switzerland, also have a night ban instead, as we so in the example. Besides these bands, there are also some additional ones during public holidays, for example during Christmas, things like that, but we do not consider these special bands in our research. And as you might imagine, and also saw in the example, these bands might have quite a high impact on the long distance trip trips through Europe. So the driver's legislation in Europe consists of two main rules. The first one, you're allowed to drive for four and a half hours and then you should take a 45 minute break. And the second one is that after two of these four and a half hour shifts, you should take a night rest of 11 hours. Besides that, there are also other rules. For example, the maximum amount of time that you're allowed to drive during a week, but we do not consider these. For simplification, we just consider one break in a trip and we introduce two variations. So the first one day variation, which implies four and a half hours of driving, 45 minute break, and again four and a half hours of driving. And the two day variation, which is nine hours of driving, 11 hour rest, and again nine hours of driving, which we also saw in the previous example. So waiting for such a roadblock, does not count for driving time in these European uh, drives legislations because you're just waiting and you're not driving. But of course, if you're standing still in such a roadblock, you can take a break there. And can you are able to schedule it in such a way that it's an efficient way. Okay, we model this problem uh, using a modified network instance. So we take our network, then we make a copy of it, and we assume that the lower layer of the network represents that you did not take a break yet, and the upper layer that you already did take a break. And then we add some artificial edges, the dashed ones, to represent driving the edge and taking a break somewhere on that edge. And we refer to this model as a stacked break graph. Now the question is, what is actually the travel time of these dashed edges? So traveling the edge and taking a break somewhere on that edge. So therefore we'll first take a look at the normal travel time functions. So if we have this edge from U to V, which takes one hour of driving time and is blocked between 12 and 2 o'clock, 
And we get the following travel time function. So, for example, if you depart at 11.30, that means that you can drive for half an hour, then stand still for two hours, and then drive for another half an hour, giving a total travel time of three hours. If you use these travel time functions in combination with breaks, that's interesting. Yes, there we go. So the break edges. Then, if you are in the orange part, you arrive there in the orange part, so that's in this example between 11 and quarter past one, you can take your break fully during the block time. So in this case, the 45 minutes, you can just take the break during the block between 12 and 2 o'clock, which leads to a travel time of the free flow travel time, which is one hour, plus the time you should wait for the block to be over anyway. If you arrive just a little later, for example at half past one, then you can take directly a break, but the break will not be finished before the block is over. So the actual time spent on traveling that dashed ash edge will be the free flow travel time plus the break time. And in all other cases, it will just be the free flow travel time plus the additional break time. So that leads to the travel time function shown in red in the low graph over here, which is the travel time function for the dashed edges and will be used uh, within the stacked graph. So now that we have a modified instance, we can run a query algorithm on it to compute our routes. We need some additional things. First, we need to keep track of the shift duration, so the time traveled since we took our last break. To, and furthermore, we need to put a constraint on it to well, say that routes that have longer trip, longer duration than the four and a half or nine hours consecutively are not feasible. But if you oppose such a constraint, then it's not possible to just use Dijkstra anymore, as you can see in this example. So if you want to travel from S to T and start at 10 o'clock in the morning, if you travel the red edge, then you first have to wait for two hours because it's blocked, and then you will arrive at 3 o'clock at U. And then drive another one and a half hour before you should take your required break, and arrive at your destination at quarter past nine. If you take the blue edge, well, you have four and a half hours of driving, so you arrive earlier at you, take directly a break, and then travel further on. But as you can see, this is five hours of driving consecutively, because you need to drive the complete yellow edge. And in our model, that does not work out, because you should take a break in between, so it's not considered a feasible route. So you should take the red one. But if you use a regular Dijkstra algorithm, then the red root, red root option will not be maintained because the arrival time at node U is later than the arrival time of the blue root. So to prevent this problem, we introduce a multi-label search algorithm or Pareto search algorithm that maintains all paths that are not dominating each other in terms of the arrival time as a node and the shift duration. So that's the three hours and four and a half hours at you for both the red and blue edges. Okay. Given the, this algorithm, we performed an experimental analysis. And therefore, we first generated our own test set Given the freight flows through Europe, we generate a 10,000 uh, start destination pairs and we run both the one day and two day variations with it, with our multi-label algorithm. And then we compare the routes to, well, actually the naive approach. So from the first slide, the beginning example, the blue route, the naive approach, just to choose the fastest route and then add the break afterwards. Uh, the arrival time of that route is compared to the arrival time of the optimal, so the, the yellow route from the example. 
So that gives the following results. So for, uh, not all routes are feasible because not all trips through Europe can be driven within the nine hours limits of one day or the 18 hour limits of two days. So that's 40% uh, and 78% for the one day and two day variations. If we look only at the routes having breaks, because these are of course the ones that are important, then you can see that 6% of these routes or 18% of these routes are improving by using the multi-label Pareto search algorithm compared to the naive approach, leading to an improvement, average improvement in travel time of 2 hours 45 minutes or even 5 hours and 14 minutes for the two-day situation, which is quite some time considering the length of these routes, which are at maximum two times 19 hours of nine hours of driving, so 18 hours of driving and then a five hour improvement. That's quite a bit. But there's a problem with it because it's quite slow. It's on average 13 seconds per query or 24 seconds per query. So then the idea is to compute these routes efficiently using contraction hierarchies. So Anna, Bas already gave an introduction to contraction hierarchies this morning during the invited talk, maybe you were there. And time-dependent contraction hierarchies are basically the same structure, same ID as the non-time-dependent contraction hierarchies. So there's a pre-processing phase that remo removes nodes from the network one after another in such a way that all shortest paths are maintained. And there's a querying phase that's applying a time-dependent bidirectional Dijkstra algorithm on the pre-processed graph. But the pre-processing is a bit different for time-dependent contraction hierarchies because in the linking procedure, in a normal contraction hierarchy, one would just add up the travel times of both, both links to form the new shortcut edge. And in time-dependent contraction hierarchies, one should, well, kind of look at the travel time functions that are shown over here and compute the new travel time function given the edge, the, the shortcut edge, which is the green edge over here. If you need to merge it with another edge, in the normal time, in the normal contraction hierarchies, one would just only take the edge having the minimum travel time, but now you should, well, Sometimes one edge is faster and at some moment of the day the other edge is faster. So you should keep both. And merging will introduce a shortcut edge which is the minimum of both travel time functions. So like this. Well, then we have to deal a bit with the driver's legislation of course in combination with the contraction hierarchies. One con contraction hierarchies only deal with the driving bands now. And we should note that only time-dependent shortest paths are maintained within the contraction hierarchy. But in some rare cases, it's possible that the optimal break planning path runs through some section that is never a shortest path at any moment of time. And these paths are just thrown away, which is not a good idea because then you will never get an optimal solution. But yeah, we should stick with it. It's just an heuristic approach. Then we have the querying phase. Uh, a time dependent bidirectional Dijkstra consisting of a forward search, then a backward search, which is kind of range based and gives all routes having, uh, well, for all time limits, the fastest routes are included, and then the forward search is continued as a downward search. This does not work with planning breaks, of course, because then you don't know what are the options to plan these breaks. So therefore, we introduce two solutions, a single label solution where we just apply two strategies. First, plan a break as late as possible, or plan a break as efficient as possible, which means during a roadblock, and the second procedure is running a Pareto search considering all shortest path independent of our start time. So we explore the complete pre-process contraction hierarchy. So then we performed again the experimental analysis with these two heuristics. And that brings us the following results. So we had 13 seconds for one day for the 
optimal multi-label algorithm. And with the contraction hierarchies, it's, well, quite low. It's uh, 150 times faster for the multi-label approach or even 1,800 times faster for the two-day variation. So that's quite an improvement. But we should also take a look at the quality of these algorithms, of course. And that's quite a good news because our all R3 algorithms, so the optimal and the two time-dependent contraction hierarchies heuristics, gave identical results for our test set. So for all the 10,000 routes, identical results were maintained, so the quality was very good. Uh, but there's a side note because the single label algorithm, which uh, just selects between the latest and uh, um, efficient option to plan a break, it, it's nowhere possible to check whether it's optimal in any way, whether it is possible with the multi-label approach because the only failure for the multi-label approach that it cannot be optimal is by using the uh, if the pre-processing goes wrong and if the pre-processing removed one or more edges that belong to an optimal break planning path. So to conclude, our optimal planning algorithm for breaks lead to an improvement in 18% of the roots of our test sets that have a night rest with an average improvement of 5 hours 40 minutes. If we were able to also plan these routes relatively fast we reduced the run times with a factor 150 by using contraction hierarchies as a method. And the quality of our algorithms is very good. So I hope in future that these things of break planning and considering bands will be taken into account in current industry software projects because that's currently not the case. And currently it's mostly the truck drivers themselves that adapt their routes according to these regulations and bans. So, thanks for your attention. All right, uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation and uh, I know it's useful. I had one trip over the Europe with truck and it's hard life, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Good to hear. Yeah. So uh, one question is, uh, did you consider that they might be, because usually there are two drivers, and then they switch between of them, and also maybe positions of uh, brakes. So usually these are fixed positions. On a route, they have a big parking slots for truck yeah. drivers. So, so did you consider any of these? Uh, I did not consider the... Um, uh, two driver options, so only considering one driver uh, things. Um, the parking lot problem I did consider, you can read about it in my thesis. Mm -hmm. It did not fit into the paper. And in general it leads to differences of like three to five minutes. It didn't have large impacts because there are quite some parking lots around and it doesn't really matter a lot for avoiding those roadblocks whether you stop, well, like 50 minutes earlier or later. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to need to do teamwork. Wow, great, good. Thank you for, uh, for an interesting talk. Um, so, you were saying with uh, contraction hierarchies that it's uh, difficult um, to know when you have these shortcut edges if you can plan a break along them, right? That was one of the yes. problems. And so, um, the other gentleman here was just asking. About, um, about, about, about parking spaces, right, where the, where the truck drivers can have brakes. Yes. Um, what I was wondering is, um, would it be useful um, if when you're computing your shortcuts, you label the shortcuts to indicate whether um, one of the edges, uh, one of the nodes that's being bypassed is one of these parking locations? Because then that might let you reason yeah. You know, that when you have the bi-directional searches coming together, they say, oh, okay, so I've got some options traveling along the shortcut. Um, could you comment on that? Uh, yeah, that would definitely be a good idea. The, the parking thing suggested I only um, tested it with Dijkstra algorithms or the basic algorithms, not with contraction hierarchies. But to implement it in contraction hierarchies, some labeling would definitely work. But I think you should mined for very large shortcut edges which are formed at the end. Well, um, 
since these are quite long highway stretches and nearly every shortcut edge will have a parking space or even multiple on them. So in that case, it wouldn't matter much, but it really depends on the area where you are searching for and whether you're allowed to park on all parking lots or just a few of them. Thank you. All right, uh, let's thank Marika one more time and uh, move on to the next speaker.